How's it going, folks? You're in the middle of the week. Congratulations to you. It is all downhill towards the weekend from here. If you like what I do with Hobby Nightmares, then please subscribe. It helps me get to my target at the end of the year of 15,000 subscribers. If you could do that, that'd be amazing. Or share my stuff to people you think may get help from it. The most amazing emails that I get are the ones from you guys where you say, listen, you know, you've helped me out a lot with depression and stuff. That means the world to me, you know. Um, hopefully you're having a good week. I'm having a good one. I went out last night and I saw uh, so a cinema nearby to me has a 30-year anniversary uh, Jurassic Park showing. And it showed Jurassic Park, the first one, in the cinema uh, twice. Only twice. And we got tickets for one of those showings. It was amazing. I loved it. And... Um, it really is a showing of how movies, you know, they, they don't, they never used to overstay their welcome. That two hours flew by. <laughs> like, that two hours of Jurassic Park flew by. It was gone within, you know, in a blink of an eye, but it was brilliant, and I loved seeing it in the cinema again. One of my favourite movies when I was a kid. Now just bring back Hook. Put that in the cinema. Once or twice, please. I want to go and see it. I want to relive my childhood. Anyway, moving on to Hobby Nightmares. Uh, Kargan says, Greetings North, greeting Kargan. I wonder what 40k army you collect, my friend. Call me Kargan, and thank you for sharing our stories and helping folks connect and vent. No problem, man. Eh? Let us get on to my story. I love Warhammer. I have since I was very young. Some of my earliest memories are sharing the hobby with my father. I would come home from elementary school and smell spray paint as I walked through the garage. My dad would be at the kitchen or coffee table working on his minis. Eventually, he would allow me to help him paint the aliens to fight his marines for a, for a Space Crusade box. We have purchased every version of Space Hulk and every box that we can afford since then. But that is where it all started for me. I am an aging nerd nowadays and share the hobby with my own son and daughter. Growing up in the 90s niche, things like Warhammer, D&D and comic books weren't as mainstream as they are today, at least not yet. Not many kids had any knowledge of Warhammer in my American part of the world. Sharing my love for reading about, building and painting and playing with Warhammer and models was not easy back in the day. I can recall a nightmare which occurred during elementary school. After finishing a math test, maths, not math, maths. After finishing a maths test, early, I flipped the page over and doodled it a suit of, Mar of Mark IV power armor and wrote Blood Angel beneath it as I wanted for other as I waited for others to finish their tests. In the drawing, I was attempting to recreate the illusions, the il illustrations. Sorry, my, my reading skills today are just not good enough. I need to whack myself over the head. In the drawing, I was attempting to recreate the illustrations from the Rogue Trader Big Rulebook and the Dark and the Angels of Death Codex. Both books I had poured through till the pages frayed and fell out. The instructor collected the test papers and went through them. Unfortunately, I had neglected to put my name on my test. So, almost immediately, my sheet was held aloft. The cheater chastised the person responsible for not marking it correctly and for the very strange drawing on the back. The entire class erupted into laughter upon viewing my humble Astartes and I was mortified. I raised my hand and meekly signed my name. At that time, I wanted to perish from the leering of my peers. Needless to say, this made sharing Warhammer difficult for a while. Luckily, I grew out of my embarrassment and found friends to share the hobby with at my local shop, Eagles Games. Sadly, that shop is no longer around. Because of all the fun and hard work done there, four more gaming stores have started in the local area and in the two decades since. One of which is a Warhammer store. Okay, well I'm very sorry that happened to you. Similar things have happened to me uh, when I was a kid as well. And we always think that it's just us. I'm willing to bet, that even though it didn't happen to you right there and then, that in other areas of the, of the, of the school there would be people there who were getting it just as bad as you, and um, I was one of those people, trust me. It happened to me a lot with nerdy stuff. Um, anyway, one of which is a Warhammer store. Time for the big reveal. I have managed that Warhammer store for around six years now. Good lad, all right, cool. I know, the body snatchers scream and point at this, at this stage. I really enjoy the work though. Every job has moments of pure frustration and running a retail location is no different. 
I have had customer and corporate interactions that could be considered nightmares, but let's save those for another time. Yeah, send them in. Please send them in. I have a, I have a, a roster of Games Workshop employees who send me stuff. About five or six of them. So please, join the crew. Send them in. And I might even be able to get you in touch with the WhatsApp group that we're all on. So you can vent to them. To people who actually know what it's like to work for the company. And for things to not quite go swimmingly every now and again. I feel very fortunate getting paid to have a hobby and play every day. And I basically had my V for Vendetta moment of clarity. They will probably come, they will probably come for me soon. But at least I have had the hobby. Cheers and thank you again, Honourably Cargan. Well, I I don't know about that, man. I mean, at the same time, if you're passionate about what you're doing and you're keeping your head down at Games Workshop and you're not trying to rock the boat and you're bringing money in, they'll leave you alone, right? It's the minute anyone, anybody at head office has any problem with you, your career at that company is over. They will find a way. They, they will find a way. It could be sheer stress. It could be bitchiness. It could be... Um, just bombarding you with stuff that's going to make you miserable, eventually they will get rid of you. If anybody head office doesn't like you, you're done. Your day's numbered, right? Just keep your head down, keep working, keep bringing the money in, and don't say anything at training days. Don't put forward any suggestions, don't do anything. Just sit there and nod along like a good boy, and you'll keep your job, and people won't come after you, right? The minute you open your mouth and say something that they don't all agree with, yeah. Anyway, Spaniard says, Hello, Mr. North. Hello. Firstly, to anybody who watches Hobby Nightmares, listen to this man when he is speaking about life. Do not simp. Choose to be strong over safe. Embrace your masculinity. Success and women will find you. Mr. North, thank you for being a voice for boys and men. Okay, no worries. Uh, thanks. That's really nice. Now to the story, which is a light-hearted one of me getting back into the hobby. As a teenager, me and my school friends played the crap out of Warhammer. Nearly every weekend we would have a game or two. We played Warhammer Fantasy and would have large thematic back battles of good versus evil. Or to try to reenact big battles from the lore. We also spent a lot of time at our local games workshop, which was run by two jolly fat men who loved the game and the lore. <laughs> I love that. Oh yeah, anyway. They were helpful but never pressured us to buy anything or made us feel uncomfortable. They ran regular raffle draws, small tournaments, or store campaigns, all to the sounds of Metallica, Megadeth, and ACDC. It was bloody wicked. Their team tournaments were stupid amounts of fun, charging a unit of Chaos Warriors with some Imperial, glorious Imperial Knights, led by a warrior priest, never got old. Eventually, Warhammer Fantasy was replaced with Age of Sigmar, which none of us really liked. Not throwing shade, it just wasn't for us. Yeah, and that's the thing that comes up a lot, right? If you don't like Age of Sigmar, you will get a lot of people saying to you that you're just some salty veteran who, you know, doesn't like change and doesn't like things that aren't like the old Warhammer and stuff like that. I hear all the time, no, but none of the veterans that I know who love old, old world fantasy, right? None of those guys judge you for liking Sigmar that I know of. They just go, no, no, it, it's just not for us. It's just not for... It wasn't built for us. If you liked the old f form of Warhammer, Age of Sigmar was not built for you. It just wasn't. And there's nothing There's nothing wrong with admitting that and going, wasn't really for me, tried it, wasn't for me, moving on. No problem. Then we, fin then we finished up school and life happened. I moved to the big smoke for work over the course of 12 years and we st stopped playing and lost touch. I sold nearly all of my stuff except for some Chaos Demons. Wow, that's what moving to London does. London is not a good place, unless you're earning London money. You know, London is not a good place. And even when you are earning London money, it's still a rat race down there. Time moved on, and I found myself blessed with my own home, a wonderful wife, and a job that allows me to work 12.5 hour shifts, so I have heaps of days off. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So you work like two days a week, and then you're, you're done. There's only so much working out, uh, working out you can do in a day, and I got tired of the video games. A few mates at work said they play 40k, and it got me interested again. I went to my closest games workshop on my day off. It was not what I expected. There was one guy in there working and no one else. Were you in Tottenham Court Road? If you are in Tottenham Court Road, I'm not surprised. Uh, 
If the, if the same manager's there, as I know used to be there, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't go in that store. I'm just going to say that. Um, I, I, I've had my fill up being looked down my nose at by people, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't need it in a Warhammer store, thanks. There was one guy in there working and no one else. There was no music. As Gimli says, you'll see more cheer in a graveyard. It was like I was in a store that sells washing machines or something. I said hello to the manager, all excited, and told him I used to play fantasy and had some slanesh demons, and I was thinking about getting into 40k. He asked if I had played Age of Sigmar, and I said, Oh no, that's why I stopped playing, it just wasn't for me at all. There were about three seconds of silence, and he replies, So how can I help you? I asked if I... Yeah, dude, it's the same guy. It's the same guy. It's the same guy. I... I it's that attitude, right? How dare you not like my suggestion? Um, so how can I help you? You know, that, that kind of thing. I, I just... The three seconds of silence, followed by, so how can I help you, is, is essentially, so what do you want? That's what he's saying. It's passive-aggressive. It's passive-aggressive annoyance at the customer for daring to not like something that Games Workshop has brought out. And um, to be fair, the Age of Sigmar models, the Age of Sigmar models are some of the most expensive in his store as well. You know what I mean? So he knows now you're in either into 40k or fantasy, and he doesn't like that. He wants you to buy Age of Sigmar. So he, he does a really long three-second silence, which it doesn't sound like a long time till you actually do it, right? Like now. That was three seconds of silence. Imagine somebody looking at you for that amount of time, and then saying, so how can I help you? Right? That's literally saying, so what do you want? Just terrible. I asked if I could look through the store open copy of the Demons Codex, and if I uh, brought in my models, could I be taught, taught through a game? Or walked through one? Fair enough. He told me they don't do store open copies anymore, and they only play the starter set games now, which were Necrons and Space Marines, and asked me if I wanted to play one of those. Yeah, again, again, this is a guy, I know this is. I know this is. I'm not going to say his name, but I know this is. This is a corporate fucking drone. This is a this is somebody drinking the Kool Aid. It would be so easy to say, "Yeah, man, bring in your models. We'll we'll put up play a little game together." And uh, do you want to see the the what what did you want to collect? Slash demons. Do you want to see them now? Because like the, the Age of Sigmar demons and the uh, Warhammer 40k demons are essentially the same. You can play them in both. But we have just released loads of really cool Slash demons. Do you want to come and see them? Come over and see them. Oh my god. The the conversion opportunities are endless with with, uh, with Celestial Demons. Because we have all these cool bits of Age of Sigmar that you can use with Warhammer 40k. If you want to sell your Age of Sigmar models, there are ways of doing that without being a dick. Right? This guy could have been sold Age of Sigmar models. You literally go, what do you want to do, man? I want to do uh, Celestial Demons in 40k. Dude, do I have the models for you? Come with me. He goes, well, these are, these are Age of Sigmar, are they not? Yes, but you can play them in both games, because the demons are the same in both games. And not only that, but there's lots of other Slaneshi parts that are exclusive to Age of Sigmar that you could proxy as things in 40k if you like the look of them. Look at these cool, look at these chariots, look at these demonettes, look at all these really cool things that we brought up for Age of Sigmar, right? You don't have to play Age of Sigmar. If you, if you play demons, you can get models from both sets. You can get 40k demons and Age of Sigmar demons. It makes no difference. But Age of Sigmar demons are newer, they're, they're more detailed, and, and they're just better, right? That guy's going to walk out with some Age of Sigmar demons right now. Right now. He's going to go, right, okay, I'm sold. And when I bring in my demons, can I play a quick game with you? Sure, man, do you have any demons at home? Yeah, I do. Bring them in. Bring them in. I'll put you on the gaming table over there, and we'll have a quick 500-point game. Uh, I might need to run off uh, and do other things, you know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm the manager. Um, but, you know, I'll do my best to give you a good game and to introduce you back into one forty thousand. Would you like White Dwarf or the Demon's Codex to look through? Yeah, cool, man. All right, cool. And, hey, here's the Demon's Codex. It's a sens sensational piece of kit. Uh, you can sit up all night reading it. Like, I, I have most of these codexes. I love them. But anyway, uh, have a little flick through. And if it's something you want to take with you today, just give me a tap on the shoulder. I'm just going to go over here and look at some other customers, all right? No problem. And you walk away. That guy walks out with at least a white dwarf. 
at least a white dwarf because he's enthused in the hobby he wants to know more and if you're lucky he walks out with the codex and if you're really lucky he walks out with some chaos demons and you haven't even got him into the hobby yet then he comes in you give him a game and that's when you sell him the demons fully that's when you say here's the demons you know, do you want to buy them and and he will if he has a good time with you in your intro game he will it's called doing your fucking job dude I'm saying this to you. If you watch my videos and you're that manager, you know I'm. You know I know who you are. It's called doing your fucking job. All right. Okay. Unless of the passive aggressiveness, I hate this. I really do. There, there were so many managers who would do shit like this. The minute you were like, "Oh no, that's not really what I'm looking for," they would go, Ugh. "So what do you want? You know, how, so how can I help you?" And it's like, "Fuck off, dude." He reverts back to, like, corporate retail speak. That's not what Games Workshop is about, right? We're not fucking Tesco's or Walmart. We're Games Workshop. Anyway. I politely declined the game of Space Marines vs. Necrons, saying I don't want to buy a whole new army. I just want to know how the demons play before I go through the work of converting them from all the square bases to the round ones. Again, you're giving him all the information for him to sell you fucking Chaos Demons. They're right behind him on the Age of Sigmar shelf. You're giving him all of the tools to go and sell you Chaos Demons. Right? The manager was very polite from this point on, but said I wouldn't be able to see the demons rules and stats unless I bought the codex and I couldn't play with them in the store. I thanked him for his time and left. Oh my days. I honestly think they don't want to sell models. Uh, to be fair, he's only, re he's only repeating there what the verbatim rules are, but the rules at Games Workshop, if you ask any manager worth his salt, the rules that come on from down high, from the people who've never run a fucking store a day in their life, right? Those rules, those guidelines, that's exactly what they are. They're more like guidelines. Pirates of the Caribbean, right? They're more like guidelines. Yes, the guy can look through the fucking, you know, codex. Yes, of course he can. Why can't he? Why can't he? Let him look through the codex and get enthused about the hobby. You know? Can you play games in your store? Games Workshop say you shouldn't, but you should. Any manager worth his salt knows you should. You get away with it as much as you can. If they give you, you know, they're not in your store all the time. If they say don't let them look at the codexes, you know that's bullshit. Let them look at the codexes within reason, right? Within reason. If they start saying, can I use the codex every time I come in to look at my rules so I don't actually need to buy it, then no, you can't. But if you want to see how the demons play and have some fun and just look at the pictures and read the lore before you end up buying your own demons, sure, there's the codex. There's a store copy of the codex. No problem, you know? I just don't get this. I know why that's a rule. Because people did take the piss. People would come in and they would say, can I use your codex to look up some rules when they're actually in a game? Like, dude, do you not have your own codex? No, but I, that one's right there. So now you've got to be a dick and tell him no. Do you know what I mean? And you sound like a dick, even though you're not. You're not a dick for, for saying no. So no, mate, you need to buy the rules. You need to you need to play the game. You need to buy the rules to play the game, right? That's how this works. But you're all the dick now. That's why they made the rule. You can't look through the codexes. That's why that's why it's there. But at the same time, there are ways of being diplomatic and saying, listen, man, you know, I don't mind you looking through it the once for playing your game, but that's it. After that, you need to buy the codex. You know, it, it just is what it is. You know, what, what do you want from me? I, I can't let you. I can't let you partake in my my stock for free. If you're using the codex to learn your rules, you're basically getting my stock for free. You're using my stock for what it's used for for free, and you're not paying me a dime, right? Yeah, there are reasons why, but there is leeway. A guy like this walking into your store who's thinking about getting into the hobby and he just wants to look at pretty pictures of Slaneshi demons and look at how the rule. And, and now he wants you there to talk him through it. He doesn't want to walk off with the codex. He wants you to go over there with him. What I would do, I'd get a set of dice, and I'd go over there with him, and I'd talk him through the rules. If, if the store's empty, the store's not, not busy, talk him through the rules. No problem. You know? Just, you just chased away a customer from your store by being a dick.
<sighs> I'm not afraid to admit that as a grown man I felt very disappointed about this game of plastic creatures. The game's workshop was not how I remembered it at all. It was just stale. Killed the magic of my, of my nostalgia almost completely. On the street I noticed the sign a few stores up that said 15% off of Games Workshop products. This sign was no more than 8 metres away from the front ent entrance of Games Workshop. I walked into that sign and, and it sat outside of a place called the Dice Arcade. It seemed brazen as fuck that a competitor would put a sign out of their premises like this. I liked it. I entered the store and was hit by a cacophony of dice being rolled, people talking boisterously, boisterously laughter and music. People were playing 40k, Magic the Gathering, Age of Sigmar and Kill Team. It was awesome. I hear a loud, hey man, how you doing? I met the store owner. I play there nearly every week now and I bring in everyone I can to this place. I got the store owner onto your channel too and he loves it. Regards, Spaniard. Well, hello, store owner. Um... If I was the Games Workshop next door, I think we're now seeing why that Games Workshop manager is a bit miserable. Because nobody's going into a store if there's a store 8 metres down the road selling his products for 15% off. And they can actually play games in their store. So you, what we may be seeing here is a manager who is from on high, right, dictated to, he takes it verbatim and it tanks his store. We may be seeing, maybe I don't know this manager, I don't know. It seemed like from his attitude that I knew who this was, do you know what I mean, in, in that area in London. I knew who this was. Um, but maybe I don't. Maybe I, maybe, this is, maybe this is somebody else. Because it seems to me that this guy has been run down from on high and is getting very, very, very frustrated and that's coming across in how he approaches his job. Don't knock people like that until you've tried it, right? I was knocking this guy because I thought I knew who he was and I thought, hey, you're acting like a dick. And he is acting like a dick, right? But at the same time, if this is a normal manager who's been told he needs to do certain things or he's going to lose his job, as in don't let people game in stores, he's been told to do behaviours that he knows will tank his store and he has to do them anyway. And then he sees a store just down the road taking full advantage of his weakness, as you should do. Right? It, it's capitalism, as you should do. He takes full advantage of your weakness. He takes all of your customers with a, with a discount. And he purports a really good atmosphere in his store. That's going to kill you as a Games Workshop store. That is going to absolutely kill you. It'll kill your numbers. It'll kill your, your customer count. Everything. It kills you. But well done to that new store for seeing that there was a gap in the market and going at it. Well done. And for providing a space. Because at the end of the day, the market tells all. We do have these sub stories and things, yeah. But the market tells all. And it's better for the customer to have different places to go. And I'm glad, Spaniard, that you found one. Moving on. Lockstep says, uh, Yo, North, I've got a weird one today about my time in D&D. &D. Well, I say D&D. &D, it was more a traveller game. Which is a sci-fi tabletop RPG that plays like an episode of Firefly when done well. Essentially, in our game, we had a ship, a small crew, and our job was to keep that rust bucket flying. No big galaxy-defining stuff, just a story about people trying to survive. We had Jess, our engineer, cute as a button, nice person. Mike, who was our gunner, my hobby bro. Russ, short for Russell, he was not a space wolf. Who was our psionics guy, space magic. And me, the pilot, called Jim. <laughs> the pilot called Jim. Good old Jim. Right. We got the group together with our DM, Steve, and set about working out the characters and the setting we were going to be playing in. Most every uh, most everybody seemed uh, hyped to go, but I was getting a weird vibe from Russell. Now, I am a nerd with the best of them. But kind of look like a normal guy. I will say that. I will say this though. I will never judge a book by its cover. If I can help it. But my god Russell made it difficult. He was overweight. And there's nothing wrong there. But wear clothes that are appropriate dudes please. He's right there. This is North saying this. There's nothing wrong with being a bit overweight guys. You know we've all had mental issues. We've all had medical issues. Nothing wrong with it at all. You know what I mean? But, you know, for God's sake, don't don't go out wearing really tight t-shirts and expect everybody to just not look at you and go, wow. You know, like, that, that's childish behaviour. It just is. You need to be a man, go out, buy clothes that suit your body type. 
That's it. That's it. I, I know, I'm sorry I'm being harsh, but that, that just is what it is. That's your own fault. If you go out we wearing, like, something that makes you look like you're wearing a mankini because you're that overweight, that's your fault, right? The weight might not be your fault. Depression might be an issue. You know, I I'm on your side there, definitely. You know, and I and you should get help working through it and getting healthier, definitely. Um, but don't expect the world to acquiesce to how you feel about yourself by by wearing like really tight band t-shirts that are three sizes too small. Don't do that. Don't be a dick, right? Take take responsibility for yourself. And no, listen, yeah, my, my weight's not my fault, but it doesn't mean that I need to like look like a mob when I go out. And, you know, really look like somebody no, people don't even want to look at. You know, I, again, I'm, I know I'm, you can say I'm being a dick, but it just is what it is, dude. Just help yourself, you know? Anyway, he had really bad body odour, wore a My Little Pony t-shirt as a 30-something-year-old man, and in general was kind of this wheezing dude who kept shouting out anime and manga references that none of us knew anything about. <laughs> All right. Before I go any further, this will not be a long tangent. This will be a minute tops. Um, maybe two. I've never got the bronies. I will fully say this. I've never gotten furries and I've never gotten bronies. Um, I've met I've met completely nice people who are bronies, who, who like My Little Pony. And I've met completely nice people who are furries. Right? But they all were broken in some way. You know, me, me getting on to them and talking to them. Eventually, you would find something had happened in their in their in their life previously that had shattered them. You know, they they were bullied at school, they were ridiculed, they were abused, they were something had happened to turn them onto those things. Right? Uh, they were they're, a lot of the furries that I know are craving. They're lonely. They're cra they're, they're desperately desperately lonely. And they don't really have the, um, at least the ones that I know, they don't really have the mental skills to go out and find other people like them. And so they do something completely weird that literally sticks their tail up in the air. And they can see where all the furries are and they go, oh, my people are over there. And they get together, right? It's a, it's a product of loneliness, loneliness I think. Um, and it can be, only be sold by compassion and, and being nice to people. And I, I know I have a go at you guys a lot in terms of furries and My Little Pony guys. Um, and that's because you freak me out, <laughs> to be honest with you. You freak me out. And quite a lot of the time, I know a lot of people who are into those things and, and they're all they're all broken in some way. They've all gone through some shit and they're dealing with it in a really weird fashion. But I also know people in those sectors who are uh, quite nefarious in the things that they're into. I'm just going to leave it at that. Right? Uh, as a games workshop manager, as a guy who's run another hobby store in my time, I've known multiple people like this. You can tell me that's not you, and that's not your group, all you like. The fact of the matter is, I can't help what my eyes have seen, and what my ears have heard. Okay? So just because you're typing on your keyboard saying furries aren't all bad... Okay, dude. Alright, that's fine. I accept that. But quite a lot of the ones that I've met have been. So... You know... I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Um, furries and My Little Pony dudes. Uh, a lot of the guys I've met have been lovely. They're broken in some way. And those have been the good ones. But they've been equally as just as much who have rubbed me really the wrong way. Or have said inappropriate things to people of ages they shouldn't be saying them to. Do you know what I mean? Listen. I've been in it. This is like somebody who works for Disney. I've been in... I've been in... I've seen parts of the hobby you haven't. Unless you've worked in, in, a, in, a, in a hobby store... And you've been surrounded by these people constantly every single day. I've seen behaviours that I really don't like. And that's why I'm able to, to look at different groups and go, not sure I like that, I'm not sure if I like that. You know what I mean? But I completely get you. Not all of you are the same. I get that. Right? I'm not trying to tie you all with the same brush. I'm just saying what my eyes and ears have, have, have seen and heard. Right? It's not nice. Some of it isn't nice. And I won't, I won't lie to you. I'm just going to tell you how I see it. That's how I've seen it. Anyway, one time, Russell sh uh, shouted something from some obscure anime he'd watched, and Jess made a clear mistake. She piped up and said she knew the reference that the show came from, and that this was kind of cool. A lovely statement, to be sure. She reached out to him there to include him in the group. Unfortunately, this was just her putting herself in his crosshairs. This story is not another 
dude is a creep to a girl story, but that did happen as part of the story. Russ was all over Jess's character at every opportunity, but Jess was savvy enough to sidestep him on every occasion. As the sessions went on though, you could see it was really starting to grate on her. We did a few jobs in the game, got credits and spent them. I got a really cool flying jacket and shades a la Top Gun. I even got some neat gloves that allowed me to link directly into the ship through jacks in my wrists. That was cool. We all got stuff that fit our characters. Russ got sex slaves. <laughs> See what I mean? See what I mean? Right? Vindication. Well, not really. It's only one person. But you know what I mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Actual sex slaves. His female character was a bit of a deviant and tried on with almost every character we came across that was even remotely attractive. And when we got a big payday, <laughs> he went on to the black market straight away and bought some sex slaves. Now... We are no bleeding hearts at our table, but this felt icky, and we made him retcon it a week later. And I found out later that the only reason our DM Steve let Russ get away with shit like this is because they go way back and were really good friends in the day. But still, Russ insisted it was all harmless fun. Of course he does. Of course he does. But it's him playing out some really dark fantasies. Guys, anybody who's played Vampire the Masquerade knows the kind of absolute creature that those games seem to pull out of the mire right yeah those the, the ones who want to what who want to act out grape fantasies and things like that just go away just absolutely go away at this point jess was kind of done with the bullshit and shut him down at every opportunity when he tried to even lock her away in game or out russ began bringing more and more just weird things into the games like going out of his way to put us in situations in bars and other drug dens where, where his character would encourage us to have fun and, and drink and get high. In this game, doing so lowered your wisdom score and so made you a lot more susceptible to, to the kind of magic that Russ's character was good at, making you do whatever he wanted. All in all, he was giving off some really odd vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the game went on, my bro Mike, the gunner, and Jess started to, to develop a partnership in the game, which was fine. And by that, I mean it was done tastefully. It was kind of natural, with no kissing or touching in-game at all. Jess's in-game mother just asked her one day if her and that nice boy are together or not. To which Jess just shrugged in the moment and said, Well, yeah, kind of, I guess. And they just ran with it. They ad-libbed it. Nothing over the top. You wouldn't even know they were together if they didn't affirm it once or twice. Now, before you all pile on Mike for being like a snake in the grass, Jess, in real life, was gay and had a missus. They are really into role-playing and are actually both theatre actors, and so Jess saw this as a kind of opportunity to ad-lib practice. Russ, as you, might, as you might suspect, was not taking it very well. He would try to get Mike's character uh, in into trouble uh, more and more times than I could even count over the weeks. He didn't cross the line until session 9 though, when we were hired to take down a prison ship heading to the Hades Gamma Cluster prison complex known as Hades 1. Our DM was awesome I know. Yeah that does really sound like cool lore that he's injecting there straight away. Anyway, we break into the ship pretending to be an inspection crew. Ah, that old chestnut. Love it. We get into, we get deep into the ship and start causing shit. As alarms are blaring, we get to our VIP. Well, Jess and I do. And we head back to the ship whilst Mike was laying down covering fire and fighting back to back with Russ's character. It was pretty cool as a moment to see those two guys come together and Mike was encouraging Russ by thanking his character a lot for saving his skin. Mike seemed to be attempting to bring Russ back into the group. He was rewarded, however, with betrayal as he let his guard down. Whilst fighting in a corridor, Russell sealed Mike inside by hacking the lock and opening the airlock on the side of the room. We were all in disbelief and looked to Russ, but he just chuckled and folded his arms. Nothing personal, guy, he just said. 
I just don't do competition. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. There are some real pieces of shit in there. There are some real, real pieces of shit up there. Dear me. The table erupted in outrage, with Russ folding his arms again and smirking, refusing to take back his action. Mike frantically asked our DM if there was anything around he could use to save himself. Russ was totally against this, arguing that he had caught him completely by surprise, but Steve, our DM, held up his finger. Uh, sorry, are you, run are you running this game, Russell, or is it me? That shut things down for a bit. Steve told Mike that there was indeed a helmet that fit his suit sitting nearby, as this was a storage room and his suit was pretty common. In fact, the Hades ship we were on, and our own, were made by the same manufacturer, which was cool. Steve was really, really good at injecting little bits of lore into the story like that to improve upon what was actually happening on screen. That is a skill, guys, that is not really um, lauded enough. You know, he could have just said, yeah, there's a helmet there. But he didn't. Because it would be really cheap to say there's a helmet there. It's like he's magicking, magicking it there. He says, yes, there's a helmet there. And here is why there's a helmet there. There's a helmet there because your spacesuits are pretty common, right? And it's used by the same manufacturer who made this ship. And by the way, the guys who made your ship and this ship are the same. The same manufacturer, so it makes sense, right? I, I've done it in, in a really shitty way there because I'm, you know, I'm not on the clock. But you know, a good DM will work little details like that into the story to just immerse you more and to, um, shall we say, cover over the cracks of what's happening. You know. So the role needed to get the helmet on in time before he sucked into space was, in D and D terms that everybody will understand, a DC 18. He needed an 18 or more on a single roll on a d20, a dexterity roll. Mike had no modifier in dexterity. This was a straight life or death roll. He rolls. Oh my god, it's the next page as well. Okay, please tell me he lives. He rolls. 18. Bang on the money. He gets the helmet on and is blasted into space. Mike turns around and gives Rust a middle finger as he heads out into the void, still probably sure that he's about to die, a slow death instead of a quick one. Still, we have no idea he is there as the other cr crew members. We're back on our ship. Rust states this too, and heads back to the ship, setting the Hades up to self-destruct. Rust gets back to our ship and relayed the story of how Mike had gone down to, uh, down to enemy fire on the Hades ship. Our characters were in shock. Jess's character was devastated, but in person, we were seething. Well, good on you for not, for not metagaming it. Good on you. Steve then asked Mike, So, um, have you checked your suit or your surroundings? Mike says, Mike says, um, Not yet, it's just space, right? He says, taking a swip of his beer. Uh, yeah, but your suit does have some boost capability, so hey, you could try your luck. All right says Mike. I'm heading to the wreckage of the Hades ship to see what I can find. And so he did, floating through space. Russ seething all the time that electronics wouldn't work as the ship was a wreck. Just accept the character as dead and move on, god man, he muttered. Needless to say, much to Russ's banging on the table in frustration, Mike found a broken convoy in the ship and floated through space trying to repair it. When he finally did, Russ asked for a turn, which he got. He ran to the controls of the party's ship to get us to jump away quickly, clearly metagaming. I asked him in character just what the fuck his problem was. My ship was my girl and she went nowhere without my touch. Weird, I know, but I'd made my character have a weird relationship with the ship's onboard AI, like Joker from Mass Effect, as it's hilarious to me. Nothing sexual, just a really deep caring relationship. That's when Mike's distress call reached us. He tells us over the intercom, everything. Wow. And we go silent. Russ simply states that Mike is lying, but why would he? The dude is floating out there in space. I stand up for, for the story at this point, though, and say, 
In all seriousness, Mike could be the one who was lying. He could have uh, led the ship to self-destruct and floated out into space to frame Russ. We just don't know. We roll to see through his lies against Russ's deception skill, and I fail hard. My character is not sure, even though I know, as a person, that this is bullshit. I refuse to metagame it, though, and accept it, but ask him to step back from the controls of the ship. This is my baby, and he's not about to touch her. <laughs> like how possessive you are of your shit, man. That's adorable. Jess, however, passes her test. Russ holds his hands up. Now look, I can explain. He makes a slight hand of check. A slight of hand. Uh, sorry, he makes a slight of hand check to jump the ship away whilst we are distracted by him by his holding his hands up. Jess rolls and whips out her shotgun and fires, spraying Russ's brains across the reinforced glass of the ship's cockpit. Jess is quite shaking at this point in real life. I'm sorry, guys, she says. I just couldn't do it anymore. Sorry, guys. Sorry. I can't play this game. It's too much. I just want to have some fun, you know? Russ then ran into a tirade over metagaming and terrible player etiquette, which was really quite rich coming from him, which I said, and I said so. Then Steve, his only ally, spoke up. Listen, dude. I've known you for years, and I have no idea what made you this angry or this devious. But that's not the game I want to play. And I don't want it in my game or at my table. I don't care how long I've known you, but this can't fly. You need to leave and do some serious thinking before you come back to this table again, alright? For now, the session is over, guys, on that cliffhanger. Pack up your stuff. We're done. We packed up and left without much being said. Russ declined to make a new character, and as far as I know, he went back to other games, 40k among them whilst we carried on at the table as a threesome. We ended up getting another guy, Mike too, <laughs> to join us, and he was a space wizard with a ponchon for opium, and he was a blast. That game is still going today, three years later. Jess's girlfriend even joined and quickly got together with Mike 2's character, which was really cool, as a brother and sister combo. Platonic, as they're not really related, and, um, and, um, so, so, platonic, as they're not really, really related, they just know each other really well. But it was kind of like Rebecca and the main guy from Edge Runners, where she likes him, non-platonically, but he doesn't really see her that way. It's an awesome dynamic, and we're really loving seeing how the characters develop. Anyways, thanks for the channel, Locke. Okay, so, again, as I was saying before, I don't want to tar everybody with the same brush. That's not what this, not what this channel is about, okay? But I can't tell you, I can't lie to you and say that, uh, you know, I've not seen a lot of people in the furry community and in the My Little Pony community who are grown men not acting in weird ways at times. Um, everybody in this hobby has a propensity to act weird. It's the hobby we're in, right? It just is what it is. We've got to self-police. But I have noticed in those areas there are more people willing to do more deviant behavior than there are in other places. It's just something that I've noticed, right? And I might be wrong. It might just be the people I've known in my hobby stores. It might just be that, right? I might be wrong. I'm not saying I'm right. But uh, that's just what I've seen. And um, as soon as that t-shirt was mentioned in this story, I kind of knew where it was going to go. Unfortunately. Um, it's unfortunate. And, you know, players like this need help. They don't need help from you as gamers. They need therapy. They need help and they need a good bro to step in. And I think Steve in this story could have been that bro. He could have been the bro to step in and say, listen, dude, that's not going to fly as he did. And say, look, this is what we need to do about your behavior. I don't think he followed up on it, though. I, I, I don't know the people in the story. All I know is he made the right call. He made the right call and ending the session there on a nice cliffhanger and saving his campaign from somebody who was trying to, de to derail it for their own deviant fantasies. It's a shame. But in role-playing, in the nerdy community, unfortunately, sometimes these things happen. Sometimes. We've got to sell police and we've got to do better. Anyway, love you all a long time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I will speak to you tomorrow for some more Hobby Nightmares. Actually, no, it's a rant tomorrow. And then it's Hobby Nightmares on Friday. See you then. Love you all a long time. Have a good one. Bye.